Did I do all that? Yeah, uh, it's uh, this is one of my first loves is this this music from particularly from this time period. And um, uh, just to say that I've I've been interested in it since I was a, a kid and always loved the stories behind the songs. And um, we're going to play a little bit of the formal music here just for a minute to listen to it. Let's see. Let's just listen quietly for a minute. Before. There we are. Okay, good. That was me. So, all right. So, um, just th thinking about that melody, can anyone identify it? <laughs> Say again? Greensleeves. It was green sleeves, yes, but not as we know it, Jim, right? Uh, and um, so I'm just gonna say a little bit about music as an important part of daily life. Uh, singing, being portable and accessible can be not only an avenue for self-expression and shared experience, but a kind of social glue. <laughs> So in that in that first slide, we we saw instruments. We saw people gathered together playing, and the, and the music that we heard was instrumental music. But you identified it as a song, didn't you? As green sleeves. So this these melodies and lyrics would would migrate back and forth. Um, and this particular group that we were listening to, it was very aristocratic. You can tell by their clothing, right? And it was something that people did um, in their evening was to gather together and make music. Um, so um, during this, the time of Virginia, it was 1607, and um, secular music was very, very popular. They, Queen Elizabeth had uh, really supported a lot of, of music makers, lots of professional composers and arrangers. catered to the pleasures and needs of the aristocracy. Um, the religious music was more problematic because there was this tension between Protestant and Catholic, and the Protestants believed that, uh, that uh, music should not be part of a religious service. It was, uh, it was popish, it was popery, and any kind of, of music that um, was complex or decorative was, was unacceptable. So you didn't find as much music being made in the churches at the time. Um, but the professional composers and arrangers were, were very, very busy. Um, there were lots of uh, wonderful people uh, creating music for the aristocrats. And we have their manuscripts because they've had them written down and they, they were uh, passed around between families and groups to play music for each other. So then we have, that was the instrumental music. These are, yes. I see. This is a madrigal. And you can hear that it's very complex. There's a lot going on. all worked earlier. Is it? Okay. So we can uh, that's enough of the matter. <laughs> so you can hear lots of very interesting parts moving in and out. And this was a delight for people to sing uh, after their, their feast or their dinner in their homes. Um, but this was not necessarily the music that people sang in the street. And so what we're going to, to sort of ex examine now is the song that might, the music that might have been played or sung by the denizens of Queen's first ship. Uh, when the first explorers came to what is now Maine, they were a hardy, adventurous lot, largely people of modest means. Their lives were nevertheless filled with music. 
The early communities here were mostly economically based and unencumbered by religious restrictions concerning music. Broadside ballads, vernacular songs, and dance tunes enlivened their days and evenings, just as they would have done in their homeland. So, um, where are we now? All right, so back to, let's see, the next picture. Plan, please. Yep, next one. Oh. All right, so here we have, again, the aristocratic uh, music school with how many different instruments? There's a harp, lute, a cello-like thing, and a, a virginal. All of these guys playing music together. Yeah. The composers of Thomas Tallis, William Byrd, and John Bull, Thomas Morley, Thomas Wilkes, John Wilby, all of these would be familiar to anybody that's done early music. And that's what we think of as early music. There was an interesting liaison, go to the next please, between the aristocrats and the common folk, and that was Shakespeare. The Globe, the Globe Theater was built so that you have the groundlings, the people on the ground. Anyone could walk in off the street, um, inebriated, and throw things at the, the actors. Um, and then the aristocrats would be up in the, the boxes. Um, and Shakespeare was fully aware of the popular ballads that were being passed around as broadsides. And he used them as a device to communicate ideas, knowing that the audience would understand the allusions to them. So these broadside ballads were like a cross between cultures, between the aristocrats and the common people. And Shakespeare used them to kind of make that connection. Um, if you go through his plays, you find lots of allusions to, to various ballads. And he would only just quote a little piece of it, but he knew that the, the listeners and the uh, the what the audience would get what he was trying to say through these the use of these ballads, um, and the one that I think is really a wonderful connection to the Virginia is the Tempest. Does anyone know the connection with the Tempest? Yeah, anyone that's not with the Virginia knows the connection. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there was um, a a wreck, a shipwreck. Uh, of the, a ship called the Sea Venture in 1609 on Bermuda. It was sailing towards Jamestown, Virginia. And that wreck, the, that flotilla of ships actually included our Virginia, which had sailed back to England and then was accompanying this, this uh, regatta, this flotilla to Jamestown and survived the wreck. Um, and the uh, the storm and Shakespeare wrote the Tempest his his play about that wreck. So my my uh, sort of fantasy is to do a a uh, production of the Tempest with that in mind. But um, and in the Tempest are are several wonderful sea songs. Full fathom five, my father lies. Beautiful song, um, and so you'll find Shakespeare's use of ballads. It's it's really uh, very conscious. So next we have, this is a printing press. You've all heard of Gutenberg, right? And Gutenberg's press was, uh, was built in 1455, which is much, much earlier, but it was the birth of mass media. And uh, they, could, they could print 250 sheets an hour on this. So there was a whole lot of stuff being printed. Um, the oldest preserved broadside ballad was Swedish, and it was printed in 1583. Now, these broadside ballads um, were very, very important in disseminating the songs and the music um, to all classes. As I said, uh, Shakespeare knew about these broadsides and used them. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about broadsides. There was a the growth of a successful and sophisticated commercial popular music industry in London, of all things, Abbey Road, right? From the 17th century Abbey Road. Um, they served a socially broad national market. This is what is known as a white letter ballad. It has no illustration. And white letter ballads 
usually were um, political or religious or moral in their content. And the ballad would be written and printed on one sheet and tacked up in the tavern or on the, the town hall. And a, a person might learn that ballad and then pass it on to another person. There were even professional ballad singers who would learn the ballad and then get paid to sing it because not everyone could read. So it was a way of getting these songs out amongst, among, amongst the populace. So then there's another type of ballad called the black letter ballad, which usually had an illustration. And um, to the next one, you can actually read the, the okay, so this one is, um, it's a very, it's just a sort of meaningless ballad about meeting a young woman on the street selling cream. Um, of course, there's lots of innuendo and double entendre in this song, but um, it's very different than the moral, uh, religious, or political ballads that were the white letter ballads. Let's see. So we have, oh, the words were written by all kinds of people, poets, hacks, somebody just might come up with a story or a song. This one is an actual event. And it's the one, um, have you ever heard the, the song about the children in the wood, the children who are abandoned in the woods? This is the first version of that. And it's actually a, 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 um, an event where this father um, committed the keeping of his children when he died. He committed them to his brother to care for them. And his brother decided he wanted to get their money. So he took them out in the woods and left them there. And this is the uh, the children in the woods or the, the babes in the woods. You might have heard that song. We still have versions of this babes in the woods here in Maine in 1941. So this, the song traveled to this century. Um, you can see that it says, very, very small, to the tune of Rogero. So it says, to the tune of Rogero. So if somebody was saying, well, how did you know how to sing these? They would put a little designation about what tune this was. Like if you were to say the tune of Yankee Doodle, you all know Yankee Doodle, right? So you would turn, you would sing the lyrics to the tune that was designated rather than printing out the music to people that probably didn't know how to read it. Um, these were very inexpensive, these ballads. They were, uh, there were millions of them printed. They have, they have speculation that there were millions of these. There were over 400 individual printers, booksellers, and publishers that can be identified. The Stationers Company of London attempted to regulate them, and records exist of thousands of ballads, thousands. But they're being sort of disposable. They'd get tacked on the wall. The, the weather would take them down. Somebody might tear it off the wall. It's like, you know, on your street, you have, have notices on what people just tear them down and drop them away. So um, there were collectors later on, like Samuel Pepys, who collected all kinds of, of these the old literature. And fortunately, he has, uh, let's see, how many? Over 10,000 survived, partly due to the efforts of collectors like Samuel Pepys. So we can get an idea of what they were all about. Eventually, political and religious turmoil impinged significantly upon this, this business, and the printers might find themselves in hot water for printing something that was unacceptable either to the church or to the politicians or the royalty. So they would disguise themselves. And so we're not exactly sure how many actual printers there were because they would sort of, you know, be decide that maybe they take a different name or they form a company that didn't have a name, like a corporate entity. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah shell, sure, exactly. Um, so next we have ah, this is a this is a storytelling ballad. Maids, let's see, noble riddles widely, wisely expounded. 
Um, and this song, which is uh, riddle, one of the riddle songs, again, has been passed down through generations, and we have we have versions of it here in Maine. Um, she's, it's very similar to um, Scarborough Fair. She says, you know, make me a cambric shirt, and, and, uh, and it's hard to read, I know, but um, it's interesting to trace these songs that we already know back to these ballads. So then, let's see, ah, Sailor's Only Delight. And this, uh, if you look, Coast of Barbary, right? Sail along the coast of High Barbary. This is the original of that song, which many of you may have heard, Burl Ice. Sail along the coast, and it's about encounters with pirates and how they, you know, sent the pirates packing or threw them in the ocean or whatever they did with pirates. Um, but again, these all date from the time of the Virginia. Uh, we have, this is a recruiting ballad and it's, it's telling all about how great it is to be a sailor and, and you should, doesn't that look like Bob there on the left with his, with his, his thrum cap? <laughs> Um, these, these sailors, that's a sailor, this guy. That's, that is a 17th century sailor outfit. And so eventually you'll see some of those guys around here. There are, there are some wonderful seamstresses that are making outfits so that our sailors will look like that. Um, but they, they were recruiting sailors to go on adventures like like the Popham Expedition or to Jamestown or wherever, going on exploring. And there were reasons why they were going exploring. Um, part of it was looking for new resources like lumber and furs, gold, the Northwest Passage. But there's a reason why there was suddenly this, this great move to go exploring. Does anyone know that what that was? Well, King James decided to outlaw um, privateering. And they had to do something with all of these out of work sailors, give them something to do. And so, shipbuilders. And shipbuilders, yeah. Um, there was overpopulation in, in the British Isles. So they, they would recruit them, girls, you know, marry a sailor, guys, become a sailor so the girls will marry you. And um, you can go and get gold and silver and, and uh, bring home riches to your family and, and glory to your nation. So there are any number of these, these um, ballads that really were motivators to get that these guys on board. Of course, it didn't turn out quite that way for a lot of them. Um, and next we have good news from Virginia. Sent from James his town this present month of March 1623 by a gentleman in that country. So the songs started being written about the actual events, about the actual explorations, and sent back to uh, England for people to sing there. And says to the tune of all those that be good fellows. Good rousing song, and you might recognize that as a march from the um, Revolutionary War. Same tune, gets passed down, new lyrics. And then we have what's next? Oh yes, this is really interesting to me. The um, the hero's name is not mentioned in the ballad, but this is a, a ballad about William Phipps, as in Phippsburg, and he was a treasure hunter, <laughs> and he had all of these adventures where he went out actually um, searching for shipwrecks filled with gold, usually coming from the Caribbean, South America, Spanish shipwrecks full of gold. And in this case, he actually did find it. And he used a diving bell to go down and, and uh, 
and bring the gold up from, it's, an, it's a really amazing story. So here it is in ballad form, and it's all glorifying the king and the ship, but his name does not appear in any of this. Um, and I have a, a wonderful uh, um, account of all of this, which I'm not going to share with you tonight, but that's another, it's another ballad from here that went back home. All right, so here we have a tavern. Now, I mentioned that these ballads would be tacked on the tavern wall. And the tavern, I mean, why didn't they just put it, you know, at the Ladies' Aid Society or um, the church, something like that? Why, why, did, why were they at the tavern? What was it about the tavern that was a great place to put ballads on the wall? You're right. It was the beer. Uh, and it turns out that from the late 16th century onwards, Britain experienced a substantial increase in the per capita consumption of alcoholic drinks across all social classes for reasons of sociability rather than uh, health or nutrition. And this was actually encouraged by the government to get people to gather together and then they would spy on them. <laughs> Not kidding. <clears throat> in 1577, there was one ale house for every 142 people. In 1630, it was one for every 95 people. By 1700, it was one for 80, one in 87. Um, so there was this real growth in taverns. And of course, along with that comes economic growth of all of the people that have to work in the taverns in one way or another. And the, uh, the, the uh, let's see, it says an average working adult may have consumed at least four quarts of, of uh, liquor, small, small and full body beer per day, four quarts. Um, wine, wine was imported and expensive and generally upper class, but the lower classes drank a lot of beer and ale and uh, those kinds of things. Recreational drinking led to more ale houses and taverns and inns, and the ballad trade depended upon ale houses, taverns, and inns. So the ballads, it was a kind of self-perpetuating uh, circle. You had the people coming into the inns and imbibing and being convivial, and there's the ballad, and the ballad singer is doing his thing. <clears throat> Um, did we do we do we skip something? Can you go back one? No, okay. Go ahead. This is a this is a typical uh, instrumentalist in the in the tavern. They would have instruments hanging on the wall. This is like a little citern and a, um, like a, a cello like thing. There's a there's a little English guitar and that teardrop shaped thing is going to figure later on. I'll tell you more about it. That's called a kit fiddle. It's a, a small fiddle used by dance masters. It could be put in your pocket, pocket fiddle. So the next picture is these guys. You can see him playing the kit fiddle is down in the, the crook of his arm. Another little sitter. And this fellow has uh, some kind of a little woodwind. So in the tavern, you have these musicians playing for the, the company. But then you also, uh, here we are, here's the company, <laughs> enjoying themselves mightily. We've got a several tavern pictures here. Yeah. You can just imagine, you know, they're raising a glass or two or three or four, <laughs> four, four quarts. Um, lots of, of these. And here we have no instruments, singers only. Now, you know, if you can't afford an instrument, you've always got one, you know, in your, in your body. So the songs, because they had lyrics and a, a story and a message, became very popular. You didn't have to know how to play the fiddle. You didn't have to know, you didn't have to own an instrument. Drinking ballads became very popular because you could make up verses to go to extend the ballad. They were full of the personnel of the inn, 
the customers representing a variety of trades, social backgrounds, and levels of drunkenness, easily learned these songs were set to familiar tunes, inviting improvisation, according to the present company. Now we're going to sing one. So, Brad? <laughs> yes. Can you repeat the question? Where were the printers of the broadsides? No, how were they making money? Oh, they were selling these. Oh, repeat the question. Yes. The question is, uh, they're wondering how the printers of the broadsides were actually making money. And it's in for two ways. They would sell the broadsheets to people that actually could read to pass them on. And they were subsidized by the government um, or by corporate entities to promote various things. So they, they got a, a, a wage from both ends of, of the spectrum there. Um, so we're going to sing this one. You want to sing? Okay. So this one uh, is called Martin Said to His Man. And you can catch out of your part. Five man five. Okay. Oh, Martin said to his man. Martin said to his man, who's the fool now? Martin said to his man, fill out the cup and I again. Thou art well drunken man, who's the fool now? I saw the man in the moon. Why, man, I saw the man in the moon. Who's the fool now? I saw the man in the moon floating on St. Peter's shore. Thou well drunken man, who's the fool? Now I softly heave a tree. I, I softly heave a tree. Who's the fool? I softly heave a tree, thirty leagues out to sea. Thou art well drunken man, who's the fool? Now I saw me milk a bull. I saw a milk a bowl. Who's the fool now? I saw a milk a bowl. Every stroke a bucket full. Thou art well drunk in that. Who's the fool now? Etc. Et so, <laughs> things like this are, were actually written down by a fellow named Thomas Ravenscroft. Before that, they were just kind of passed around and, and developed all kinds of uh, different variations. So Thomas Ravenscroft was uh, born in, uh, let's see, 1582, and he died in 1635, which is our period of time. He was one of the earliest to document these convivial songs. They weren't really ballads. They weren't really, um, you know, they didn't tell about history or anything. They were just basically songs people sang. And he was a chorister of St. Paul's and graduated at Cambridge in 1607. And he came out with this book called Pamelia. Let's see, is this, oh, this is Deuteromelia. Was there one before this or is this Deuteromelia first? This first one. 1609, see here, right there. At the figure of the white lion. <laughs> and he, he, he put together not only um, the songs, but he would write parts so that people could learn parts to them. He did uh, Deuteromelia, the next one is, this is Melismata, that's 1611. I think the next one must be, yeah, this is Pamelia, which is 1609. And you can see it says here, Delightful catches of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, and ten parts. <laughs> and so, if you recall, if you recall the the um, madrigals, which you know were delightful uh, layers of parts and sound, people could kind of imitate this aristocratic style with these simpler songs written out in parts. Now, one way to get parts is to sing. Rounds, and you'll see it says pleasant round delays and delightful catches. So we're going to sing together one of the rounds that appears, and that is next slide. Look at this three blind mice. 
big hit in 1609. Three blind mice, Dame Julian, Dame Julian the Miller and his merry old wife, she scraped her tripe, lick thou the knife. So a little bit different than cutting off my mouse's tails, but um, it's also in a minor key, which is kind of interesting, doleful song about scraping tripe. Three blind mice, three blind mice, Dame Julia, Dame Julia, the Three blind mice, three blind mice, Dame Julia, Dame Julia, the so let's try the next one you know this one hey ho nobody ho who knew who knew that this was popular at the time of the Virginia. Now you must remember that he didn't write these and publish them in 1609. This is the stuff that was being passed around and he just grabbed it out of the air and printed it. So we can imagine that the members of the crew um, and even the aristocracy, Raleigh Gilbert and, and John Popham might have actually sung these while they were making their way across the ocean. Let's try this one. Hey ho, nobody at all. Eat nor drink nor money have I none. Fill the book of Hey ho, nobody at all. Meat nor drink nor money have I none. Fill the book of Fill the book of Hey ho, nobody at all. Meat nor drink nor money have I none. Etc. Etc. There. Good job. All right. So again, a, a, a round that we all know that comes down to us from sixteen nine. There are a lot of other songs uh, in these collections, things like The Three Ravens, or The Frog Went According, or The Fox Went Out on the Chilly Night. They all appear in these, these uh, books that were, were written down by Thomas Ravenscroft. Um, I mean, I could go on. There's just lists and lists of these that we still sing today. Quite wonderful. Um, so yes, here we are, the frog, marriage of the frog and the mouse, tweedle, tweedle, twine out. Um, 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 the merry um, and the merry um, and the merry mouse um, in the mill, tweedle, tweedle, twine out. So I'll fall down in the well, um, 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 and the merry mouse in the mill, tweedle, tweedle, twine out. Da -da 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 -da. I think the next one has the best of the lyrics. There it is. Oh, yeah, you can't read it very well. I actually uh, did make some some copies that you could read, but we had some difficulty with the the. Uh... Anyway, it's the usual story of the, the mouse marrying the frog and the rat. They have to get the the permission from the rat, and there is some thought that this actually is a political um, story that involves. Uh, an aristocratic English woman marrying a Frenchman. And I know to call a Frenchman a frog is not a good thing, but that was what was done. And the rat is the Pope. And so I had to ask my uncle rat. Um, and then there's, it's just the usual thing where they, they uh, get, it doesn't work out because the cats and the kittens come tumbling in. But again, back to 16.9. 
Um, then we have what else here? Oh, tomorrow the fox will come to town. This one is is fun because um, it has. Um, I, I know this, and it's in my head, and I'm being distracted by motorcycles. <laughs> um, to follow the da, 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 da. tomorrow, the fox will come to town. Keep, 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 keep. Tomorrow, the fox will come to town. I'll keep you all where there. I must desire you, neighbors, all to hell the fox out of the hole and cry as loud as you can call. Whoop, whoop. Woof, 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 and cry as loud as you can call. I'll keep you all well there. Let's try that. Tomorrow the fox will come to town. Keep, 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 keep. Tomorrow the fox will come to town. I'll keep you all well there. I must desire you neighbors all to kill the fox and all the hall and cry as loud as you can call. Woof, woof. Whoop, 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 and cry as loud as you can call. I'll keep you all well there. And then it goes on to all the things that the, the fox will do. Uh, we did this over the weekend at Pamaquid, um, and there were some dogs in the <laughs> who, when we did the whooping, decided to howl. <laughs> it was quite wonderful. Yes, Stuart. The fox went out on a chilly night and blamed them for him. Well, there it's interesting. There are you follow these through time, and they they do shift. And in fact, yes, this is probably the oldest. Oh, actually, there's an, an even earlier version of the fox, um, but it's that you know age old story of the fox stealing the chickens and people trying to prevent it one way or another. Of course, John goes to the top of the hill and blows his horn both loud and shrill in the song that we are familiar with. Um, there is a wonderful main version that's in a minor key uh, that I found in the collections that I've been looking at. So um, again, a timeless story um, that Thomas Ravenscroft took the time to write down. And so we, we get to imagine the Virginia crew singing whoop, 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 as they're sailing across the ocean. Yes. When did staves come into this place? Well, that's a good question because, as you see, there aren't any. Um, and and I'm not exactly sure. I think that that um, as music became more codified, um, I have seen staves in the early uh, like um, songs, Elizabeth Queen Elizabeth's virginal book. There are staves, so I'm not sure why Ravenscroft didn't do that. You know, it was things were still sort of forming in terms of of writing things and uh, coming up with a system that everybody understood. So that's not really a very good answer, but, you know, late, late 17th century, I would say. We can see this on the G No, exactly. Yeah, how do you know? Yeah, although one of the other ones did uh, have, it's a, uh, yeah, and you can see there's a, a little glyph there at the beginning. So um, it's all in code. Here's the, the frog. Okay, let's go move on to the next. Okay, now we have. Julia, a lot of music at that time. Yes. Oh, repeat, yeah. repeat for this statement. Um, let's see where they are. Ah, yes. So what I was going to say, just that the um, later the politicians began to use songs to encourage and choreograph heavy drinking as both a test and assurance of loyalty to the crown. So they get everybody blasted and then say, here's the king. And if people didn't, they, they might say, gee, you know, maybe that guy's a traitor and we'll carry him off either to the pokey or to the press gang to take him off to Virginia. So um, I just wanted to say a word about shanties because I knew that people were gonna ask about sea shanties and even today there's some confusion about what are shanties and shanties are word songs rhythmical improvisational songs used for specific tasks where coordination and teamwork are required such as raising an anchor pumping and raising sails now thinking about those jobs raising anchors, pumping, raising sails. Can you have a story? 
Not really. It's because you don't know how long it's going to take. So your shanty is an improvisational song that people can keep adding to, kind of like those drinking songs that we just saw. So there is no actual evidence of people singing sea shanties as we know them until the 19th century. But we suspect that they used those drinking songs or maybe even rounds. Hey ho, nobody ho. Need nor drink nor money have I done. You could really use those and, and they're sort of interminable until the, the job is done. Pumping particularly was sort of ongoing and um, raising a sail, raising an anchor, anything like that. They were they were not the story song ballads like our, that were on the broad sheets. Uh, the earliest reference that we have to something like a shanty um, is, is this, and it goes, Yeehaw, Tossa, hail in the brails, thou hailest not by God, thou fails. I see how well our good ship sails. And thus they say among, hail in the war tech, it shall be done. So there's a call and response thing happening here. And the bosun or the, the uh, someone is shouting <clears throat> the orders. This is from, um, let's see, we've moved ahead a little bit here. I just want to say this one thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the sailors themselves were generally unlettered and learned their songs from the oral tradition. Simple ditties were rhythmical and familiar. When hauling a wet sail in the dark night, with the wind howling, the song would need to be pretty basic. We can surmise their songs may have been Freeman's songs with homely lyrics, such as were uh, sung in Ravenscroft's books. So this is an image from a theatrical production 1570, yep, you can go back to the theatrical production. Go ahead, next one. There we go. Um, and it's it's sung by theatrical sailors. This was not sung on board ship, but it describes being on the ship. All things we have ready, nothing we want to furnish our ship, but ride it nearby. Lustily, lustily, lustily. You can imagine it's kind of like Gilbert and Sullivan, you know. Yeah, Pirates of Penzance, you know, they're all dressed in their pirate clothes or whatever, singing lustily, lustily. Um, and we're here we are, we're great sailors, we're going to overcome everything. But this is not an actual song that was sung on board a ship. Um, so most of the documented seafaring songs are ballads about seafaring exploits, recording specific historic events, or instructions in morality. Um, this one is, uh, oh, this is the High Barbary, Sailor's Only Delight. Uh, the next one is, ah, Captain Ward and his ship, Majesty Ship the Rainbow. Captain Ward is a dastardly pirate fellow and the rainbow, um, uh, and count the encounter the rainbow and there's there are any number of different versions of this now but this is the original uh there so see this one is oops did we cut off the top um just notice a... this name and the beginning of the verse who is that walter raleigh yes here we are can you move it down just a little bit um... No, it's this projector. Okay, the proje projector is too high. Well, this one is um, allegedly about Sir Walter Raleigh and his his encounter with pirates. And uh, there is a young a little cabin boy or a little sea little where is he? The young the young sailor volunteers to go and you know drill holes in the the Spanish galleon. It's the version of the Golden Vanity. And uh, do you want to sing that one? Too? Sorry? Yeah, right, right. Well, it's interesting that this song, in this version, it all turns out fine and the cabin boy is, you know, he gets rewarded. But in the versions that have come down to us here in Maine and, and in New England, um, it's not so. And so Fred's going to sing The Golden Vanity as sung by Harriet Murphy in, um, uh, Mount Desert Island, 1941. And you can sing the chorus. Mm -hmm. 
My father owns a ship all in the North Country. That's a little long. Yeah. My father owns a ship all in the North Country. The name of the ship is the Golden Vanity, and I fear she will be taken by some Spanish crew as she sails upon the long on the lonely Now the first to speak up was a saucy cabin boy. Oh, what will you give me if her I will destroy? I will give you gold and silver and my daughter fair and gay. If you sink her in the lonely in the lowlands, if you sink her in the lowlands, low. the boy bowed his breast and he jumped right in. The boy bowed his breast and he began to swim. He swam to the side of that lofty Spanish ship for to sink her in the lowlands. In the lowlands, for the sinker in the lowlands, low. Now some were playing cards, and some were shaking dice, and some were in their hammocks, and the water cold as ice. He bored two holes in her broadside, and he let the water in, and, and he sank her in the lowlands. In the lowlands, and he sank her in the lowlands low. The boy he swam back all to the starboard side, and being most exhausted, so pitifully he cried, Oh, Captain, take me up, for I am weary of the tide. Yes, I'm weary of the lowlands, of the lowlands. I'm weary of the Lord and his Oh, I'll not take you up, the captain, he replied. You won't have gold and silver, nor my daughter for your bride. I will stab you, I will shoot you, I will sink you in the tide. Yes, I'll sink you in the Lord. In the Lord. I'll sink you in the lowlands low. So the boy he swam under all to the lover's side, and being most exhausted, so piteously he cried, Oh, messmates, take me up, for I am sinking in the tide. I'm sinking in the lowlands. In the lowlands. I'm sinking in the lowlands low. So we threw the boy a line and drew him up the side. We laid him on the deck and there he shortly died. So we wrapped him in his hammock that was so long and wide. Now he's drifting in the lowlands. In the lowlands. He is drifting in the lowlands alone. Yeah, I mean, once John Bowen that song actually changed to a tragedy, but uh, if you could read these lyrics, you'd see that it's, it wasn't that originally. It's so interesting how the songs change. And we suspect that, you know, when they were brought here, maybe someone couldn't remember, or they had a bone to pick, um, or they just, you know, just decided to tell their own story. It's hard to know. Some versions of this, uh, you can tell that the person doesn't understand carpentry, for instance. Um, there's a, there originally it has an auger. He's, he's, he's got an auger, which he's going to, to, um, uh, a brace and auger. And in one version we found he ties the auger to his braces, which are his suspenders, because the person, this was a woman who, who sort of figured, well, he can't swim if he's holding on to this 
apparatus. So he's got to tie it to something. So he tied it to his braces. Anyway, it's the variations are really interesting. Um, so let's see, what do we got next? Oh, here is uh, again in praise of sailors. And uh, we have in Maine several versions of this as well, where the uh, the, the uh, sailors are um, praised and compared with um, plowmen and girls don't don't marry the plowmen because they you know they're just a bunch of wimps. You want to marry the the manly sailor. We have five different songs in the main collections that go back to this song of the. The sailors, and there's one little section in here that mentions the mermaid. You all know the song about the mermaid, right? Yes. Well, in this in this one section, it says there is a mermaid on a rock with a comb and a glass in her hand, and we know there's going to be a storm. So someone extracted that and turned it into the song about the mermaid that we all know, where everybody's drowning. Isn't it great? You know, yeehaw! <laughs> Stormy winds do blow, and the that one uh, that all the Irish singers sing goes back to this song, which we can date to 16, 10, 12, that time. And again, remember that these songs weren't necessarily written at the time they were published. We find versions of them even earlier, back into the, the 1500s, some of them. What have we got here? Oh, this is the, again the same. Uh, Right. So what's next? Sailors for my money. Sailors for my money. Again, it's uh, the, uh, that praising of sailors, which show up in, in a number of ballads that we still have. Let's go to the next slide. I'm not even sure what time it is at this point. Or keep on going. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. So, oh, gosh, this got, uh, this got cut off as well. So this is an account of dance uh, in, in New England. And there was a, a fellow named John Jocelyn who came to Maine, and he didn't have the religious agenda that a lot of the writers uh, who came and you know, sort of wrote about the, the denizens of Maine and the men of Maine are godless men, uh, you know, that kind of thing. This guy uh, notices uh, that there, there were local Native Americans they sing pretty odd, barbarous tunes, which they make use of vocally at marriages and feastings, but instruments they had none before the English came amongst them, since they have imitated them and will make kits and string them as neatly and artificial, artificially, workmanly, as the best fiddle maker amongst us, and will play our plain lessons exactly. The only fiddler who was in the province of Maine when I was there was an Indian called Scosway, whom the fishermen and planters, when they had a mind to be merry, made use of. So you can imagine this fellow is looking for an opportunity to maybe make some money. And he makes these um, <clears throat> kit fiddles. Now remember that picture of the kit fiddle. So here's, this is what they look like. It's a, a sort of a tube with strings on it. And these were a very simple instrument that could withstand. They're about, you know, about 18 inches, about 18 inches tall. And um, this one has a nice little head carved on it. Remembering that the life here was pretty primitive. You're not going to have lutes and harps and virginals and all of those beautiful, you know, well-crafted, instruments you're going to have something that's going to serve the purpose does anyone know what musical instrument has been on earth yet problem anyone know it's a jaw harp one of these little you know c-shaped things you put it in and it goes wang, 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 wang. I, I don't play one i don't want to break my teeth okay i got to thinking you know some of those guys probably didn't have teeth <laughs> So they could play them. They found a couple at Pemaquid as well from the same time period. It was something that could make a sort of rhythmical, slightly musical drone, which people could dance to. And they did in the in the taverns, like John Earthy's tavern, um, which was the earth the, the tavern keeper at Pemaquid. So we're going to sing uh, John Earthy's tavern now. This is a 
song that Fred made imagining the tavern at Pemaquid. And it has a great chorus for you to sing. When ever I'm weary and tired to the bone from grubbing out stumps and from digging out stones, there's one place I know where my spirits restore. John, it's tavern by the pen, it's sure. And my words come there's all kinds of people that you will find there released for the moment from worry and care from field and from forest and ocean may come for some john barley corn or some kill devil rum kill devil rum in the cold days of winter, the evenings are long for a pipe and a glass with a story or song. When a traveler stops in for a meal and some beer, he leaves as a friend. There are no strangers here. No strangers here. <laughs> No strangers here. But what's one thing we lack is this one thing we miss. That's a bonny young wench for the again to kiss. For here in our settlement, women are few. So lacking a young wench, an old one must do. <laughs> old one must do. <laughs> old one must do. <laughs> Old one must old one must Some folk in the village they think it's a sin that we have no church for the worship God in. But there's one place I know will my spirits restore. John at least tavern by the Pemaquid shore. Pemaquid shore. John at least tavern by the shore. So he mentioned that there was no church at Pemaquid, and uh, what is the, the religious evidence at Popham? Can anyone tell me? Did they have a, a minister with them? Yes, yes they, did. they did. Okay. They had a chaplain. And they invited the, uh, the Indians uh, came and had services. They them. did. Things were quiet and respectful. Quiet and respectful. Not, probably not a lot of singing. Because the Protestant church at the time did not care for that sort of thing. Um, I read this in, very interesting uh, account of uh, they the... Sang yes, but the way they sang them, they were completely unharmonized. Except that they allowed people to come up with whatever melody they thought they should sing at the time. They didn't sing it together. It, it was this cacophony of like, oh, I'm going to sing this tune and you're going to sing that tune. And it was this real mess of, of sound. I mean, Charles Ives would have loved it, apparently. Um, eventually, later, you know, in the, in the early 1700s, they started having singing schools so that people could, could actually get coherent with their psalm singing, so they're all at least singing the same tune. But it was not um, psalm singing as we know it, hymn singing as we know it. It was very improvisational. Yes? Well, that would have been probably... Yeah, you know, keep the question so that okay. some people know what... Right. When did the shape note singing come in? Um, and shape note singing was much more a, a early 19th century thing. Um, but I think it was a reaction to this, this sort of free-for-all that uh, was occurring in New England. Um, they, weren't, they wouldn't allow any instruments, but in the early 1900s, they actually would have a cello with dots painted on it so that you could you know, at least play what they called a ground to keep everyone together. Otherwise, it was just sort of, you know, strange. Yes, Stuart. In many ways, kind of medieval. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, the the religious music was pretty primitive, um, and and the other singing, this secular singing, was much more um, organized and convivial. Um, the for some reason the Puritans did not care for for anything that was ornamented. They didn't want any kind of of uh, popery or any kind of decoration on anything, including singing and music, um, at least not on Sunday. <laughs> the rest of the week, they probably, you know. What about percussion and the bells? We don't have a lot of evidence of that. Um, in, in Salem, in the late 1600s, they actually did have um, instruments. They, they have uh, discovered people's, in people's wills. And, and in journals, they do talk about it. But if you think about Salem versus a place like Hamaquid or Popham, there were actual, you know, reasonably built houses in which you could keep, you know, a, a delicate instrument like a lute or a, or a you know, a virginal or something like that. In, in these cabins in the wilds of Maine, you really could not have those kinds of instruments there. And they probably used, you know, whatever they had to make what we might call a kitchen band, you know, playing spoons or pots and pans and things like that. You'd have the jaw harp, you might have a whistle. And as we've seen the kit fiddles, you know, to kind of make a, a little droney kind of dance tune that you could, you could kick up your heels. Does anyone know where the first maypole of record in North America is? Damerskov. Damerskov. There's a record that says, the fishermen have erected a maypole and are making very merry. And so you can bet there was some singing or music or something that went with this maypole. This is in 1630, something like that. 1623, my authority tells me. Um, and later, um, there was a maypole in, uh, is it Quincy? Mass, yeah, Quincy, Mor Thomas Morton's Maypole, but that was a very different story because it was near to Plymouth. The, the uh, authorities at Plymouth were absolutely incensed by this. They sent Miles Standish to arrest Thomas Morton because he had erected a 60-foot Maypole with antlers on it and had invited the local Native Americans to dance around it with and they were just, they thought this was terrible. So they sent him back to England in irons. Oh. Um, and the judge back in England said, what's the problem? We have maples here all the time. And they sent him back to New England. He eventually ended up on the Isles of Shoals uh, where he was cared for by the tribal members who thought the maple was a great idea, apparently. Um, but again, they had this maple in Damascove and nobody cared because it's the wilds of Maine and we're all a bunch of heathens anyway. But down close to, to the civilization, something like that was not acceptable at all. So, um, well, we could do one more song, a new song that Fred made about the Popham colony, if you would like to hear that. So, there he is again. It's wrong. We did we, we did find in the um, the recordings that we've been listening to field recordings made here in Maine between well, before 1945. There's one song and it takes 37 minutes to sing it. Not very good. Yeah. We're not doing it. Yeah. But just to say that that valid tradition was alive and well here in Maine until the mid forties, until records and radio and multi, you know mass media of the new kind came in, people were entertaining each other with these old songs, some of which go back to sixteen seven. But this one's a new song, and it is a ballad about the pop of comedy. When King James, one of the English crown, three ships, two ships came forth from Plymouth Town, the gift of God with Mary and John to Virginia made their way. George Father was the leader then, and with him went, with him went our hundred men to build a fort on a northern strand. 
and for the winter's stay. Using tools of the proper sort, they built a house and sturdy fort, a brave adventure to support and a colony to begin. Then Raleigh Gilbert looked, it seemed, up every river, brook, and stream. The Northwest Passage was the dream. Would all of their fortunes win? <clears throat> but as they viewed the woods around the oak and pine, and there did abound, the like of which had not been found in England for many a year. There was among those hardy whites a shipwright, Digby, he was hight. He raked laid a keel by the water's bright to build a pinnace there. As autumn's days began to wane, two ships sailed back across the main, leaving forty-five great men there by the ocean side. Then, was then that's the next one. Yes, a month or two had passed before the winter's icy blast brought great hardship, cold and frost. Twas then George Popham died. The colonists were in great need when Raleigh Gilbert took the lead. Strong of will and rash of deed, then whether it is right or wrong, with haughty mien he sent his men to fight the local Indians. For food and firewood ran out then, as winter lingered long. But Donkey Dick be labored on as big beams were hewn and planks were sawn. A pinnace frame was raised and on a ship of thirty ton. The hull was planked, the seams were cocked, the mast was step spars rigged aloft. The sails were bent when she was launched. Virginia was done. But they had scarcely rigged the clues when a ship came there and brought sad news. John Popham had died, John Gilbert too. But Raleigh was his heir. He burned Fort St. George to the ground for fear by France it might be found. To Compton Castle was Gilbert bound to friends and family there. Two ships, the broad Atlantic crossed, the Popham called and he was lost. The Plymouth Company bore the cost, but all was not in vain. Virginia also made the trip the first of many wooden ships crafted and sent down the slips, all from the coast of Maine. Thank you so much.